Get ready to take a flamethrower to the official narrative and learn what the elites don't want you to know. You're listening to The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. It's episode 2552 of The Tom Woods Show with Tom Luongo, who is a former research chemist turned geopolitical and market analyst, and he's publisher of the Gold, Goats, and Guns newsletter and blog. We want to talk today about some topics that um, I think Tom has a unique take on. And Tom, you and I are going to be seeing each other very soon yeah. at the Mises Institute's Supporters Summit, October yeah. 10th through the 12th yep. of this year, 2024. So I hope a bunch of people will be seeing us there also. So welcome back. Well, thank you, Thomas. Appreciate it. It's good to see you and it's good to, to, to be back on the show. Well, uh, likewise. So w- we're going to talk today a little bit about what's going on right now. Like, the you know, everybody, as usual, everybody always quite understandably follows what the Fed is doing and is, is mm-hmm. it going to announce this or that or is it going to cut rates and blah, 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 the whole thing. Like everybody follows it and I understand why they follow it. You bring a level of nuance to the issue that is is often absent from these conversations. So I want to dig into that. But as long as we have got on the table that you and I are speaking at the Mises Institute sure. event in Hilton Head, can you give us a sneak preview of what you're going to say? Because you're like the dinner speaker on the Saturday yeah, no, night. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. Truly, they, they, it was it was funny. I, I, got, a, I got the call from the Mises. Uh, I got, actually, I got an email from a recruiter that uh, said, hey, they reached out to me. I'm like, great. Would you, are you willing to do it? I'm like, of course. And then I was chatting with Rachel over from the Mises Institute while we were working it out. And apparently, you know, my name came up conversation for this and uh, Lou Rockwell just stopped everybody and said, that's it. That's what we're doing. And I was like, she told me that I started, I almost started to cry. It was kind of like, you get that kind of level of, 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 uh, of affirmation from someone who literally changed your life. Like, it's really cool. Um, the preview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, it's going to be controversial for the Mises Institute a little bit. It's going to be somewhat, some of the stuff that we talk about today, um, which is that we should be looking at in this moment in time, there's a very interesting moment in time where we may, even as Austrians, may not, it may not behoove us to look at the Fed as only the villain and to look at them in a storytelling sense as a, as a different, as a, in a different role. And then I think we, if we do that, we have a very unique opportunity. That's the way I'm going to frame this, a very unique opportunity to kind of level up as market, commenta- market commentators and and all of that. I think it's a very interesting moment in time. And I thought about this for a long, long time. And the minute I got the call, I was like, I know exactly what I'm talking about. How, I'm gonna, how I had the structure of the talk? Well, that I've been practicing for about three months now. So we'll see. Because that's what I do. Um, so there it is. All right. Well, looking forward to that. So lay out for us. And I think we've, we did this a little bit the last time you were here. Mm-hmm. But yes. wh- why it makes sense not to think of Let's and when I say the financial establishment, I mean I, I suppose I'm talking about the Federal Reserve. I'm talking about Wall Street, but uh, mm-hmm. there are a lot of mainstream voices out there, and and mm-hmm. that it makes sense to think about it not as a single undifferentiated blob, but as uh, and and not necessarily say that we have any dear friends among them, but that but that they are not all united together in in what they want to do they have they have uh, mutually contradictory goals yes. and and we and but how do we see that playing out of the news and and sure what kinds of goals do they have that might be across purposes with each other well the, the, i think the best thing to, to 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 remember is that when everybody's winning when everybody's on the same page and that they're like marching towards their preferred more perfect technocratic union um Everybody's winning. Hey, um, we're all on board, right? It's kind of, I like to use the hockey metaphors. Like ev- there's no complaints when in the room when everybody's winning, but the minute you start losing, then everybody starts pointing fingers and you know, we find out who slept with whose wife and you know, all that. And then eventually they have to fire the coach. That's the, ho- that's the hockey joke. In, because they can't fire the players. In the central bank world or in the globalist world, uh, you have to think of it in terms of, well, when their interests diverge or when one group turns predatory on another, this is kind of kind of classic cartel analysis, right? Uh, that we Austrians like to do. Like we, we all believe that, you know, it, it, the cartel analysis is actually probably the best 
analysis for this or the next frame, best framework for this is like, you know, there's always going to be an incentive at some point for one member of the cartel to break with whatever it is the cartel thinks they're going to do next. Well, in the case of the central banks and the commercial banks that they represent, or at least in the United States that they represent, what the World Economic Forum and the European Union and the IMF and the UN, what they're proposing doesn't jive with what Wall Street wants. Because what they want, right, simply put, what they want is the end of the commercial banking. Like if you, it, it, they, they want the end of like private formation of capital in every fundamental way. All the things that we Austrians absolutely, um, you know, argue for, cherish, all the rest of it, and strenuously argue for it. But we, you know, in our current environment, we have a two-tiered monetary system, or two-channel, two two-cycle monetary system. The central bank prints the money, lends it to the, the commercial banks, and the commercial banks then turn around and lend it to you. And those are kind of two circles, two chains, and they, and they intersect the central banks, or the commercial banks. Well, central bank digital currencies programmable central bank digital currencies where everybody has a, a, you know, some digital dollars on their phone or more appropriately digital euros and digital pounds um, have no need for commercial banks because you just get your money directly from the central bank. So if the central bank doesn't want, doesn't want to lend you money, then you don't get money if you, if, and for whatever reason, this is what the, the big worry about, uh, about central bank digital currencies, CBDCs is all about is like, it's programmable money where they can, you know, automatically deplatform you through an AI script. Well, where does JP Morgan fit into that? Where does Goldman Sachs fit into that? Where does Nomura fit into that? They don't. That's the joke. And so, and that's why I'm saying to myself, look, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve, especially Jerome Powell, who came out of the private sector, as opposed to Bernanke and Yellen and all the rest of them were all academics, like, Powell's friends are all on Wall Street. They call them private equity Powell folks. Like, it's not hard. And so the Federal Reserve ultimately works for Wall Street. And if Wall Street is going to get cut out of the future, then what incentive is it for them to stay in the central bank cartel? That's the question I've been asking for three years. So you're all confused. I just want to make sure that you understand well, what I'm, no, what I'm I, getting I, I do follow that. I, I'm I'm just thinking that eventually I want to I want to ask you a, a more fundamental question about central bank mm -hmm. digital currencies. Unless they abolish the dollar, uh, and and we have no choice, right. what happens if people just don't adopt the central bank digital currency? Well, that, well they, they tried that don't in, use in it? Nigeria. It didn't work, right? They they tried force feeding it into Nigeria. It didn't work. The Chinese have been trying to force it, the enforce the digital yuan on on their people, and it isn't working. And so, what are they going to do here in the United States? I don't know. Um, I don't think they're going to ever get it. I, I, I've talked to Daniel DiMartino Booth. I've talked to a bunch of people about this. And they're like, CBDC is over Powell's dead body. Why do you think they're trying to get rid of it? Or why do you think they blocked his second term so hard? All right. So, I, yeah, I mean, don't, don't, get, don't get lost in it. It's just like my, so it's my argument. So you ask, like, how do we get to, how do we see it in the real world? Well, we see it really simply by the fact that Powell raised interest rates to five and a half percent over the screams, howls, and squeals of the European Central Bank. Everyone, I mean, everybody. So the classic vulture capitalists coming out of, uh, coming out of uh, the, the private equity world. I mean, Powell torched relationships and friendships with his, his private equity friends for two years now. But Wall Street, and I'll specifically say, I think Jamie Dimon over at, um, over at JP Morgan has said, no, 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 we have to do this. That, uh, uh, you know, that you see from our perspective, these people look like vultures and vandals and, and this, you know, evil, um, evil rent seeking. I'm trying to keep it clean, Tom. Um, <laughs> right. And, um, they're evil rent seekers. Right. And from their perspective, the way they see themselves, they never see themselves as the villain. Like, I think Jamie Dimon sees himself as a patriot. I mean, if you listen to him talk and you think about things from Jamie Dimon's perspective, when I listen to Jamie Dimon talk, I see a guy who sees himself as a patriot. So I don't ever see him really selling out fundamentally U.S. interests. Whereas, and, and, it's, and it's very clear, he said, he was talking about this la literally last week saying, 
all of my very liberal friends don't understand what's about to happen. They're all finally starting to get it on in New York that Kamala Harris can't be president. I mean, this is Jamie Dimon coming out and literally telling everybody, you need to vote for Donald Trump. Um, and during the primary, when he came out for Nikki Haley, I had a bunch of people say, well, look, he came out for Nikki Haley at the neocon. I'm like, yeah, no, what he really did was he legitimized Republican voting in the Republican primaries to his liberal Wall Street friends. And it's like a baby step. Let's move us towards Nikki Haley. And then when Haley falls out of the race, then, you, then Diamond is clearly backing Trump. Um, and he's not just like angling to be Treasury Secretary or anything. It's nothing like that. So um, like... It, 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 to look for this stuff, you have to see like what policy happened. Powell raised interest rates faster than anybody in history coming out of COVID. And you could argue that he did so for Keynesian reasons. Let's bring, you know, let's get, bring down aggregate demand. Mode. The economy wasn't, I mean, it wasn't stunning or anything. It was just, you know, year over year uh, baselines numbers look great because they were so terrible during COVID. So, you know, Powell understood that they printed trillions of dollars and he needed to get rid of it all. And even when he was a junior member of the Fed, Powell was always the hawk at the Dubs table. So while Bernanke and Yellen were destroying, literally destroying the country with zero bound interest rates and QE, Powell was sitting there going, what are we doing? The entire time. But he was, of course, in the minority at the Fed. And so, you know, when this, this, when this started, it was, I think that this... The, the, the big thing is watch his relationship with Christine Lagarde. Whenever they're in the same room together, they don't talk to each other. Christine okay, Lagarde and I, and identify head, her? The head of the ECB. Uh, the, the head of the ECB, yeah. right? And so the European Central Bank. Yeah. Um, if this goes, for me, this goes all the way back to just before Powell um, started effectively tightening, and he did so in June of 2021 um, by sucking a lot of money into the reverse repo facility. Basically, he just sucked cash out of the the global dollar markets and everybody pushed their money into the 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 reverse repo facility and we're collecting five extra basis points, you know, 0.05% over the Fed funds rate. But two weeks before that, he was at a summit with with Lagarde and Lagarde was she had her big speech plan where she was going to coordinate global monetary policy to fight climate change. And the big push was on at the time. Like it was a huge push. Greta Thunberg was everywhere and you know, the WEF was out in spades with their marketing campaign. And then Powell goes to this Green Sea Summit. You can look this one up. This is hilarious. And Powell, Lagarde goes on this huge speech about how we have to coordinate global monetary policy for climate change. Powell gets up there and, you know, farts and says, I have a dual mandate of full employment and stable prices. I don't fight climate change. That's not my job. And Lagarde's like, if she wasn't wearing a red neck scarf that day, then her neck turned beat red and she was really, really angry. Um, two weeks later, he then re, uh, starts the draining of the offshore dollar markets through this reverse repo facility, very technical stuff, but that's what it comes down to. And then in you know February, March of 2022, when he's finally reconfirmed after the Biden administration blocks him for six months, he starts raising interest rates and he starts raising rates aggressively and everybody starts screaming at him. And about every four to six months, read three or four Fed meetings, we get this massive move in the bond market, which you can see in the real world, where U.S. rates drop like a rock and there's a full court like um, media press to get Powell to pivot, to get Powell to cut rates. Powell needs to pivot. He needs to do this. He needs to do this. And, and he kept saying no over and over and over again. And we haven't seen anything like this since Paul Volcker. And... Um, and it's just a very, and I think it's a, I think that's your prima facie evidence at this point that we were able to sit at five and a quarter percent for 15 months. And no one ever thought Powell could get the 1%, no less five and a half, then hold it there for 15 months. And whether the worst banking crisis in March of 2023 since um, the fall of Lehman Brothers in 2008, it was an, it's, it, it, it's a stunning like turn of events. And, you know, and if you, you know, if you didn't like, and I didn't believe it when I first thought about this. I, you know, I know you and I talked about this the first time I was on the show. I was trying to explain some of this this this, this very early on. I said, "Look, I don't believe. I didn't believe this was true. Well, like, come on, you know, kind of doctrinaire Austria. You know, the central bank is evil and the Fed the whole nine yards." And then I just stopped looking. I started looking at it, going, "This doesn't make any sense." Because by that point, I understood that the euro and the European Union was the real problem in the world. Uh, from a political and from a financial perspective. My, 
my argument, my, my, my vision of how the world op actually operates has deepened and changed this the more I do this and the longer I do this. So. Hey everybody, this is not a sponsor message. I just wanted to remind you, first of all, that my Christmas party is coming up December 7th. It's about 35 minutes southeast of the Orlando airport. And it's a wonderful time. A chef prepares dinner for everybody in our own kitchen. I have several minor celebrities who are going to be coming. And it's just a wonderful night to get to know a lot of really great people. You can be yourself. You don't have to watch what you say. Uh, and everybody raves about it. So I hope you can attend. It's a benefit enjoyed by members of my supporting listeners program. Now, I have supported people on Patreon in the past, and I've been very happy to do so. But supportinglisteners.com beats the heck out of any Patreon you've ever contributed to. Because how many of those people are inviting you to a Christmas party? Or how many, instead of having you look at a godforsaken screen 24 hours a day for their content, are also mailing you in the physical mail a print newsletter like this one, like this one's 16 pages, this one, this one's 20 pages. You get that in the physical mail, and it's not just the same things I send in my email newsletter. It's all fresh content, not seen anywhere else, just for you, nice and hot. So for a change, you can be old school. Remember, we were old school, right? We, we liked reading physical things. Well, ain't no podcaster or any Patreon sending you a physical newsletter, or for that matter, inviting you to a murder mystery dinner party for free. I have several of them lined up for around the country with many more to come. The one in New Orleans still has plenty of spots available, and you can pay to attend these murder mystery dinner parties, but you don't have to. Just be a supporting listener of The Tom Woods Show. You get that for free, not to mention my censorship-free Tom Woods Show elite group. It is the best possible supporters program in the world, and you're part of a community that you just can't beat. So check it out at supportinglisteners.com. And before you know it, you will be holding in your hands one of these right here. Supportinglisteners.com. And thank you very much. So in other words, with, within the content, not, not within, um, you know, like a, a meeting of the Mises Institute, but within the context of, let's say, the monetary establishment of the U.S. and mm -hmm. mainstream opinion, you would say that relatively speaking, Powell belongs among the hawks. Yeah, he belongs, like he belongs among the good guys at this point. Not because he's trying to save, he's trying to save the Fed. Because the Fed's independence is as, is as tarnished here as anybody else's. Like the Fed as an institution is staring at oblivion. When the Fed's at the zero bound, it's not even a central bank. I mean, it so really then, isn't. It's just, it's just like the Bank of Japan's been. So then, how would you describe uh, or identify the people you would say are lined up against him? Oh, I would say it's it's everybody across Europe. It's the European Central Bank. Um, it's what you would call the the World Economic Forum and, and and everything around that. What I like to call Davos. The bigger problem is that those same people have political control of the United States through the Biden slash Obama administration. If you look at all the people that have been stabbed in the Obama administration, are all the same people that ran in the Biden administration, all the same people that ran the show during the Biden administration. Like Janet Yellen just moved from Fed chair to Treasury secretary. Like um, Samantha Power moved to USAID. Like they're all, Victoria Nuland came back, the architect of the, 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 the global Maidan. Like there's a, they put very specific people in place. Um, they put all the war hawks on the National Security Council to foment the war in Ukraine. Um, and they put all the worst kind of communists, like the Cass Sunsteins, the Samantha Powers, the Gary Genslers, all of these people, terrible, like horrible, um, Mayorkas and all of them. They're all there as vandals to burn the United States, what's left of the United States, institutional um, capacity to the ground. And, you, and it's at, it doesn't matter if it's a DHS, it doesn't matter if it's an EPA, it doesn't matter if it's a Department of Transportation with Pete Buttigieg, they're all on a mission to bring the United States low in order to bring it ultimately in line with the capital efficiency of Europe, which is some far worse capital efficiency, it uses you know, capital far less efficiently than we do. And um, you'll always see them out there screaming about tax normalization, OECD rules about tax normalization or harmonization. And, oh, and, and explain, ta that this is another one of these terms that mm. they soften to sound nice, but what is tax normalization? 
Well, it's like our harmonization. It's just to say harmonization hey, is even better. They used to say that yeah, during NAFTA. It, right? it, it's it, it's it's absolutely. It's just let's get the corporate tax rates exactly the same. Let's get the let's. It, oh, your banks are more efficient than ours. Well, then you should hold thirty percent more capital on your books than ours do, so we can lend more, so we can be we can be equivalent. It's just it's always this. It's it's always a soft pedal of cheap egalitarianism. It's what it winds up being every and, and, time. And what it also means is there's no there's nowhere to escape, or there are fewer places to escape mm-hmm. if everything has the same regime. Right, right. And that's what they're fighting tooth and nail. That's literally what they are fighting tooth and nail with Donald Trump. And I'll, don't get me wrong, I'm I I, I kind of like Trump, but at the same time, I'm not going to vote for him again. Just why not? Um, I'm in Florida. It really doesn't matter. We're going to win. He's going to win Florida by seven points. But what's important, and I'm FYI, folks, I, the reason I haven't shaved is I haven't had power for four days. We're doing this on backup power. Um, and, um, um, they, but Trump is a mixed bag and he's going to be good on some things. He's going to be bad on other things. In many ways, the same way Powell is good on some things and bad on other things. But I'll be honest with you. Like, I think back over the last three years and I don't disagree with any move that Powell has actually made. And I say this as honestly a doctrinaire Austrian, but it's what you, but you've got to get out of the domestic mindset and just think about the domestic economy. You have to think about the fact that the Fed has been, whether it should be or not, the central bank of the world, which is what Powell was handed when he got the job from Yellen. And kind of all, for all of our lives, the Fed's been the central bank of the world. The, the, the growth of the offshore dollar system and everything post World War II. So it's very hard for us to see him in any see the Fed in any other role. I get it. Like it was very hard for me to see. I I resisted this for weeks. I was like, no, this can't be right. I got to be wrong about this. But when you start to go through the basic incentives of who the Fed works for, who the Fed represents, blah 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 blah, blah you realize, oh no, that actually makes more sense than this the standard the, the standard answer that the Fed never does anything right. Like, I'm not saying the Fed's, you know, right. I'm not saying that they're, you know, the five and a half percent is the right interest rate or whatnot. But as I think I said to Bob, I said, you know, if I had been in Powell's position, I would have just raised interest rates like you know, over five meetings to 6% and left them there. Just walked away. Like, let's see how the world gets used to the cost of you of capital at 6% and let it sit there for a decade and let it just kind of work out all this malinvestment and, and all the rest of it. Like, I would have the easiest job in the world as a central banker because that's what I would do. And then I go play World of Warcraft for the next 10 years. Because I wouldn't do anything else. How does, how does Japan fit into this picture? Oh, God, that's a huge... Do do, so you say you only want to go 30 minutes, 40 minutes, Tom? What, he said, um, he said, Give us the gist. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, short, the short answer is that Japan, the Bank of Japan has always been the Fed's wingman, right? So when we were essentially the global central bank of the world, right? Or the, prov- or the um, provider of global liquidity to um, uh, to uh, bias the world towards owning uh, credit-based assets as opposed to physical assets, the Bank of Japan was there to um, to serve as our wingman and reinforce that policy. Well, under Powell, now Japan's in a much different position than we are, and their politics, the more I, de- I del- now I've del- started to delve into Japanese politics, and part of what I wanted to actually talk to you about today, but that's okay, so, because it's all fresh in my head. I just came to these, these ideas like literally like this morning. Um, and because I was writing an article that I have to was due for Newsmax on the last day of the month, and so I, I wound up writing about that. But this election with it with um, with Ishiba coming to power in Japan is very interesting because it reinforces what we're seeing with the Bank of Japan. While everybody else is starting to cut rates, the Bank of Japan is beginning to raise rates. Now, now usually the Bank of Japan is the first one to the bottom, and then everybody else kind of follows, and then and then they say, and then the Bank of Japan stayed there, and everybody else kind of. But there was always this nice big fat Japanese put under, under the market. And the way of putting it is that you can always go, always, you can always, you have a one-way trade. You can always borrow cheap yen. And then you can use those cheap yen, those that you borrow to go do, to finance whatever else you want, right? The, the specifics don't really matter. It's what we call the yen carry trade. But the Bank of Japan in late 2022, on his way out the door before Kuroda, the head of the Bank of Japan left, he started to, like Powell, started technically to start tightening monetary policy. I don't need to go into the specifics of it, but, um, and then after that, his, the expected successor said no to the job and fell on his sword for the good of Japan and said, you know what? I, I was helped. I was the, I don't remember his name, unfortunately, but I was, 
I was there to be the architect of this terror, of this policy. Policy in Japan is changing. I don't think I'm the right guy to go forward. So, huh, that's interesting. In a, um, in a society that values seniority like Japan does, for a senior, for a senior person like this who was supposed to get the job to turn it down for the good of Japan, that's new. Turns out that the wing uh, of the, in, in Japan, there's like two wings to the Liberal Democratic Party, and the Liberal Democratic Party basically runs Japan, has for the, the entire uh, post-World War II order, because basically we run Japan, right? Um, but there are two factions within the LDP, within the Liberal Democrats, and we were used to the Abe, the Shinzo Abe wing running things, which is basically, like, hey, everything bad that the neoconservatives want, you do that, Right? So if we need you to weaken the end in order to at attack China, you do so. If, you know, whatever, whatever they, whatever you want. So that's it. Started at the central bank with um, uh, Kuroda giving way to Kazuo, uh, Kazuo Ueda, who is now currently the uh, the the BOJ president. And Ueda, very slowly, very timidly, kind of like Powell, took about a year before he finally said, "Hey, no, we're raising rates." And now he's tightening monetary policy. And now Shiba is going to be, is, is coming in as the prime minister because he just won the election for the uh, liberal the leadership of the Liberal Democratic Party over the weekend or on Friday, which spooked markets. Shiba is part of the other wing of the LD, of the Democrats, meaning we're going to get a, for in lack of a better term, think of it that we had raging neocon corporatists running Japan for 70 years. Now, the Tea Party is taking over. Relatively speaking, the Japanese version of the Tea Party is taking over the country. The country. Not the Republican Party to be fought by the Democrats who were, you know, the, the, but the country. And you're going to see Ueda get support in his renormalization of monetary and fiscal policy in Japan over the course of the next few years. So everybody calling for the end of Japan right? Exit that trade. Trust me on this one. What this really means is that you have, while the Fed has decided to start having to loosen because we have, because his five and a half percent at Powell taking us to five and a half percent has, a, has damaged credit markets here in the US. This damaged borrowers and, and the economy. We still want it. His goal is still to tighten the global liquidity for dollars. Well, if the Fed can't do that because he needs the lower interest rates, he gets the Bank of Japan to do it for him by strengthening the yen and changing the and, and unforcing an unwind of all of these cheap yen loans to the carry trade. Again, I'm trying okay, to keep yeah. it as, can, can I, to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah, right, right. So yeah, this is exactly where I want to jump in because I, I, I would mm -hmm. like to have it explained how the monetary policy of a significant country like Japan affects people not in Japan. Like, well, why would that not be confined just to them? And so can well, you explain it? Like, you know, for sure. somebody who's not familiar I'll do, with I'll, all this. I'll do my, do my very best. The short answer really is that we have a global economy. Yen flow around the world, dollars flow around the world. They're all priced at whatever, you know, you, if you can go to the Bank of Japan for a long time and borrow money at negative 0.1%, right? And then you could turn around and, and even when we were 0.25%, you can then, you know, borrow yen at point negative point one and buy US Treasury making 0.25 and you can pocket the spread. In that case, 35 basis points of 0.35%. Or you could take turn around and you could throw it into Italian BTPs at 4.4.5% and make that much more money. As Japan starts to raise their interest rates, right? Those trades and everything's priced around the current regime of where the current where the exchange rates are and where the the spreads between bond yields between different countries are everybody's like looking for yield everywhere. The simple, simple truth is that in every market, capital efficient capital flows are treated best, right? It doesn't, it's not hard. This is a like basic, but you, you put your money into whatever's going to give you the best yield for the least amount of risk. Well, if you've got a one-way trade on one side of the thing, that's zero risk. You can go out and you can get 5% in some other market. Great. Bob's your uncle. Do the thing. But when it starts to change and the exchange rate also changes, remember the yen weakened or strengthened 
dramatically over a very short period of time from 162 to around today, around 142, 143. It's a 15% thing. If you're only making 5% in the market, you're not going to wait three years to get paid back on your on this, this, this trade you thought you were making 5% a year on. You're now upside down by 15%. And so those trades have to be unwound because they're not profitable anymore. And that means that the people who borrowed in have to pay back the loan and then they got a, and then they get dollars and they get rid of the dollars and they can move them somewhere else. And, and so it causes a tremendous amount of dislocation in the markets. What we found is that the yen carry trade, the latest version of the yen, yen carry trade was fueling a lot of the rise we saw in tech stocks over AI. So in tech stocks, uh, to a lesser extent than, than Bitcoin and, um, and, and whatnot. So that's what we saw. We also saw it in, you know, in, in, in European bond yields as well, because, well, I mean, I'm sorry, but I can't, I just don't understand how, you know, the Italians can get away with, with selling 10 year debt for less than we're selling it for, right? I mean, we're getting 3.7%. They're getting what, 3.5? I don't know. So it's, it's, it's silly, but part of it is because of this, 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 this situation. So, when Japan changes monetary policy in a global environment and everybody's been, been borrowing yen, then it's now everybody's problem. And it's going to cause a, you know, an unwind of the old trades. And most people don't have any idea where those yen went and what they've been borrowed against. So we're just going to watch it kind of explode every. And so what I'm, I expect from the Bank of Japan is every few months, they're just going to kind of come in and go and then kind of drop a uh, drop a stink bomb on the market and force it to move um, when they need to. And so I, they did that in early August. And we saw the, the huge unwind of the first leg of the yen carry trade. Then stock markets fell, you know, everything, you know, everything, you know, everything crapped the bed, like basically, uh, but for about 48 hours. And then was or reorganized. The Bank of Japan came out a little after that and said, no, we're not going to do any more than that. It's okay kind of gently letting people know things have changed. And that was actually, it turns out, a precursor and a, pre a premonition of what was going to happen at the Liberal Democrat elections that over last week. It was really, really fascinating. So um, there's, a, uh, there's a great substack. If you're interested in a lot of this stuff, there's a great substack written by Ira Harris, his son Tobias, um, called Understanding Japan. It's on substack. It's excellent. Uh, it's a, just an excellent blog and it'll, it'll really give you an insight as to what's going on in Japan. It's, it's been invaluable for me. Hey everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO? Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? will get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. Well, you and I both know that presidents will get more blame sometimes than they deserve for a bad economy mm -hmm. and more praise than they deserve for a good one. Even though there are yep. things that pr presidents and politicians can do that would improve the economy. There are definitely um, obstacles they can remove that will have a measurable impact. But a right. lot of times, monetary policy is the mm -hmm. one, is the thing in the driver's seat and the average voter knows nothing about it. So they're, mm -hmm. you know, so they're inclined to blame the president. So I, I hate to ask for you to put sure. your prognosticator hat on because it's just not fair. And, nah, you know, and I don't want it. people going back to this episode saying, well, Tom Luongo didn't read the future just precisely. <laughs> but fair still, enough. we do have a presidential election coming up. Mm -hmm. And whatever is about to happen with the U.S. economy will be blamed on or the source of praise for mm -hmm. the incoming president. So what yep. do you think the incoming president has to look forward to 
or dread? Um, it's a little bit about depends on who wins or, or sorry, let's, let's be honest here. It depends on who is allowed to take office. I'm just going to put it that way. Um, Trump is going to, if, if, and I'm, this is what I'm seeing now, everything geopolitically tells me that they realize that Trump is going to win beyond the margin of cheating. And they're not going to be able to stop it on election night. They'll slow the process down. They may, they may have some other weird plan to try and invalidate various states and not certify certain state elections and whatnot. But eventually Trump is going to wind up being president if the vote is where I think is going to go where I think it's going to go. And they're going to saddle him with at least two wars that he won't be able to get out of. That's why we're seeing a rapid escalation by Israel and Lebanon. That's why we're seeing, that's why we're seeing Ukraine push into Russia, even though you know, it's a, it's a meat grinder that the Russians are just killing the Ukrainian, what's left of the Ukrainians' best troops. It, and it makes, strategically, none of this makes any sense. But the goal is to leave Trump with no option but war that he has to clean up. Because the goal is, which I have to realize, I haven't even touched on today, is that Europe and Britain are so broke, are so broken, and they are dealing with political uh, revolts that are substantial that they have to default on their sovereign debt and they need a war to justify it. And they want us to fight that war because they know we can't afford to fight that war. And therefore, if they're going down, we're going down with them. That is the sum and substance of the Biden administration in every way. It doesn't matter if you look at it culturally, from immigration, fiscal policy or any any of it. That's what they're setting up. They're accelerating this into the close, right? Into the um into the into the election. If Harris wins, a lot of these things will back off in the short term. And then the big question is what is Powell going to do? If I'm right and Powell is at odds with these people, what we'll see is the following. We'll see him actually be more dovish with an incoming Trump administration because he'll want to give Trump as much help as possible to to get things restarted, right? Uh, and allow him to do some fiscal reform, which I firmly expect Trump to do, um, along with the monetary. So he'll ease a little bit more because Trump is going to fix some of the fiscal stuff and that will be, and that will be better. It's just similar to what Ishiba is going to do in Japan. Just watch what Ishiba is going to do in Japan because it's going to be a similar thing. He's going to fix some of the fiscal stuff and the Bank of Japan is going to normalize in, um, monetary power policy slowly. If Harris wins, I fully expect Powell to start raising rates or cut less quickly or, or less overall because she's not going to fix anything on the fiscal side. He's been extremely critical of the Biden administration's fiscal policy. So, and that's rare for Fed chairman, if not unprecedented for him to literally come out and say, no, you need to get your fiscal house in order. Monetary policy can only do so much. So, um, and then, so he'll, if he, you know, and, and the, on the other side of it, you can also make the argument, just, I, I know this is, I'm, I'm, I sound like a little bit all over the place here, but you can also make the argument that what Powell is literally saying to everyone is if you think you're going to fight a three front war around the world, with like is on behalf of Israel, Ukraine, and against China, well, you're going to pay five and a half percent for the, for the war. And nobody can afford a war of five and a half percent, a global war of five and a half percent, which means that either the Fed has to be dissolved and brought back under the treasury, which is, which the Democrats have already, um, um, trial ballooned that thing, the same thing they've done with the Supreme court, right? If we don't uh, get what we want, we'll pack the Supreme court. Elizabeth Warren's already like made this clear that she's ready and willing to bring the Fed back under the treasury because they don't have control over it. Whenever you see them complain about something, it means because they don't have control over it. And I yeah. think that's the best way to read a lot of this stuff. And once you see it, you can't, re- once you see it in, in one a- area, you can see you can see it everywhere. It's not really Well, John Kerry the other day complaining about the First Amendment. Exactly. Getting in his way. Mm-hmm. Saying, I can't it's, control it, all these voices. And I, the thing is, in a, in a just world, I ought to be able to. I'm John Kerry. Right. No, and, and John Kerry is just a grifter. Like he always, you know, he's not even a grifter. He was groomed from birth to do what he does, which is to be that, you know, to be that person. People like Hillary Clinton are just grifters. Like, I don't even consider her. I mean, she's just kind of comically, um, banally evil, right? Whereas people like Carrie and 
Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and others are kind of cartoonishly evil, like Bond villain level evil, you know, the, with the, the kind of solipsism, the kind of narcissism that, you know, you, you write case study that, you know, psychologists write case studies about, you know, you know what I mean? Clinton's easy. You know, she just likes money and power and, you know, she has people off that you know, she's, yeah, I mean, that's, this is, that's Hillary Clinton. She's not, she's not difficult. She's an old Arkansas grifter that likes to run, that'll run drugs or pe- whatever. And she doesn't care. So, and she'll do anything to, to protect herself from going to jail. She's not hard. Well, I think the scenario you describe is plausible. The, the one area that I think is debatable mm-hmm. is, is, is whether Trump is really going to engage in any fiscal reform. He didn't last time. He doesn't seem that interested. There are no votes there. I mean, you and I right. want to see spending rain down, but nobody else really does. I mean, when, when you pin them down, where would you like to see spending, spending brought in? There is no section of that budget where a majority of Americans want to bring the, the spending down except foreign aid, and that's not yep. going to make a dent. So I, I'm, well, I, 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 you know, that would be I'll where be I, that would be, a, that would be where I, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not arguing with you, Tom. That is exactly where I think we should cut. The talking point I've been throwing out there as much as humanly possible. You don't think we can cut spending? Uh, how about we just kill USAID? Like, let's just get rid of the whole thing. Like, let's just get rid of some of the, 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 like the grants and the, like so much of the money. I was talking to a guy the other day, a friend of mine, a patron the other day. Um, and we were talking about, uh, about all of this. And he said, you know, we spend over a trillion dollars overall of the, of the federal budget is spent on grants and foreign aid and this and everything. It's, it's, we spend it overseas on a whole bunch of things. We, we, we call them grants. We call them, um, you know, <laughs> um, not, not just grants, but there's about three or four other words like, like endowments and this and that, and there, all these little things, they get dumped into, they get dumped into budgets and, and, and the defense department budgets and then, and, and that money can, stop flowing tomorrow we could i know we could cut a trillion dollars from the budget and have it have almost no effect on the domestic economy itself because all that money goes overseas so it's not like we're taking a trillion dollars worth of jobs out of the american economy we're taking 10 billion or 20 billion dollars where the sgna on that on that trillion dollars and saying how many how many federal employees is that a couple of thousand like okay so we fire those people we put them on unemployment we pay their benefits and we get rid of the rest of it i it's possible the question is and here's the, the, the other thing I would argue as well is that systems don't change until they're under existential crisis, right? Under existential threat. When everybody's fat and happy and everybody's making money and everybody's fed, systems don't change. The minute you get really far from disequilibrium, things start to change. As a chemist, that's where, every, that's where all the interesting stuff happens. Nothing happens at equilibrium. That's where all the equations are written. They're easy. But no one's thinking about what happens when we get two, three, four standard deviations from the main, mathematically speaking, or, you know, just we're way, we're way away from this equilibrium. And that's why I argued about the Fed being in that kind of position. The Fed was literally under existential threat because they, the, the world wanted, you know, the, the very, these people, I, I like to call them Davos, wanted the U.S. at 0%. They never expected to get all the things that Bob and I talked about, SOFR, the high interest rates and all this stuff, that's all the plumbing necessary to build the foundation to allow for the, for the Federal Reserve to actually do monetary policy for the United States as opposed to doing monetary policy for the world. And so if that's where we are, well, cool. Like, But we have to build that foundation first before we can start to change all the other things. And if, we're, and if that part of it is, is in place, and they don't, you know, then the vandals don't have monetary control of the country, then there has to be tension between monetary and fiscal. And then at some point, we fix part of the monetary side. Uh, we're still running a $2 trillion deficit and we can't afford it. And it's five, and we can't pay 5, 5% for it. Eventually, it's either you let the thing blow up and collapse or you fix it. And that's when all of a sudden everybody can go, you know, I'm going to run on the platform fixing spending. And putting more money back in your pocket, you know. I know that it didn't really happen under Reagan. I know that he did. I know that he, you know, he campaigned on that, and it didn't didn't happen. But again, back then we had the balance sheet room to do that. We didn't have an eight trillion dollar Federal Reserve balance sheet. We didn't have a thirty five trillion dollar deficit. We didn't have a hundred and plus billion trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. So we ran up that national credit card, 
And now we can't pay the bill. Well, we can pay the bill, but we're going to have to cut back just like everybody else is doing around the country right now. So I don't know. We'll see. And I think that our cent- and I think our commercial banks want to keep lending to Americans. And so they're willing, to, they're probably at a point where they're willing to take a punch in the mouth in order to get this, in order to get this done as well. It depends on the, depends on the bank though. Not all the banks are, are, are on board with this. Banks like Morgan and, and Morgan Stanley and, and, and Goldman are on board with this, but like Bank of America, Citigroup, no nope. Bank of New York Mellon, nope. They're all, they're all in the tank for global, com- global communism. They have been forever and they haven't changed. Part of it is that because their balance sheets are so vulnerable. But that's, a, again, a different discussion for a different day. Well, let me close with this. Um, see if you can do this in 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. Totally unreasonable request. But Maybe. I want to know how you, where you come down on this whole issue of, we actually have a very robust economy and um, Biden is just doing a bad job promoting it. And people are complaining about nothing. We, we actually have a really great economy. What's your opinion on that? Oh, I don't think so. I think Powell rate, cut rates by 50 basis points right out the gate. Remember, central bankers, don't. it's like all politicians, never listen to what they say, only look at what they do. And he said, oh, the economy's still solid and bold. Yeah, yeah, okay. And pull the other leg, it plays jingle bells. The economy's terrible. Like, um, you know, my 18 year old daughter can't find a half decent job. Have all the, 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 the small businesses in town aren't hiring. Uh, most of the job openings that are out there are phantom job openings. You actually go to apply for the job and a lot of them, you know, they're just there to, to they're, they're just nonsense. Um, bankruptcies are up at a faster rate than in since, uh, Lehman Brothers. Same thing with credit card delinquencies and everything else. The economy is terrible. Powell knows it. He did what was he was supposed to do. And this is Powell the Hawk cut by 50 basis points. Anybody else would have cut by 75. So no, the economy is terrible and they're just lying. This is about kid. This is about coordinating Queen Kamala. And the only reason that inflation, CPI inflation is so low is because they bombed the oil markets back into the low 70s, which is not sustainable. Um, and I can tell you, I can tell you, this, 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 here's my 10 seconds. And I can tell you, having talked to a lot of guys who were oil traders in the pits, they're like, we don't trade oil anymore. It's complete. There's no market there. It's a completely controlled market. And so uh, you keep the price of oil down, you keep the price of gasoline down, you keep the price of gasoline down, you have no commodity cost push inflation. China just stimulated. And copper was up 3% last night. Iron ore is up 8% today. Tomorrow is the, first, the beginning of Q4. Every, everything is going to change in Q4 of this year. Everything. And I don't know what it's all going to look like. I, I can't predict it all, but I can predict some of it. And, uh, but we'll see. So, well, What's a link people should follow to uh, get more of your stuff? Um, you should follow me on Twitter or X at TFL1728. You should follow me. Uh, you can go to goldghostandguns.com, which is the blog. Uh, you can check the podcast through all cr- cross-posted there as well. I don't do a lot of podcasts. I'm nothing like you, Tom. I'm not nearly as prolific, but I do try and um, have really interesting guests on as often as possible, or as often as I can remember. And then, of course, it's paid, most of the service comes from Patreon and Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns. Uh, most of my media appearances, including this one, will be posted there for free for anybody just to sign up. And then everything else after that is, you know, it's a small okay, thing. Great. Well, I'll make sure this stuff goes up at tomwoods.com slash 2552 and also in the video description. But Appreciate I will it. be hearing from you, as I mentioned at the beginning, in the not very distant future, under two oh. weeks from now. And I yep. don't know if it's sold out or not, but you can find out the details at Mises.org slash events, and you'll find the Supporter Summit. So maybe at the last second, you can snatch one of the remaining slots, and you'll get to hear from uh, Tom and me. My talk is called Our Enemy Public Health. So I think that should, I, I'm going to try to make that as entertaining as I can. Mine, mine is called, it's, uh, Now is Our Time to Slay Dragons. Are We Prepared? Yeah, and that sounds like a good dinner talk to me. So, uh, Tom, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Tom. It was great to see you again. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Make yourself and those you love less vulnerable to the regime, both mentally and physically. Get more forbidden information at tomsfreebooks.com and be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen. See you next time.
Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.